Chad, look up wombat poop. No, I'm not going to look up wombat poop. <laughs> it's been a while since we've been to the academy, but it's time to go back to Sam O'Nella's academy and learn about something. Yeah. In fact, we're going to learn about an attempted or maybe successful presidential assassination. But the one that nobody talks about according to Sam O'Nella, so uh, yeah. Or Ass-Ass-I-Nation. Ass-Ass-I-Nation? Yeah. Are you trying to be vulgar? Are you trying to be No, I just like goof? looked up and I was like, does it re is it really spelled that way? And I was like, yeah, it really is. Ass-Ass-I-Nation. There you go. You guys ready for this? Let's do it. Hey kids, John Wilkes Booth, Lee Harvey Oswald, yep. Hitler, all people who gained massive notoriety by killing one of history's famous leaders. But there are two Americans who committed an equally heinous crime as these three, yet their stories are seldom remembered, mostly because nobody really cares about the presidents they killed. Originally I was going to talk about both of them, but the video ended up being way too long, so today <laughs> we'll just stick to uh, this one I guess. Charles J. Guito was a pretty silly guy, and to understand how a guy could be so silly, you gotta start with his youth. Guiteau was born in Freeport, Illinois in 1841. His mom had postpartum psychosis and oh. died when he was seven, alongside three of his five siblings. Holy his dad, meanwhile, shit. was mega religious and made a big point out of instilling those values in his son, often physically. This influence molded Charles into a boy who sought nothing short of total approval from others and who would react very harshly to any criticism levied upon him. As a teen, he moved to Ann Harbor, Michigan for high school. He tried to get into the University of Michigan, but he goofed on the entrance exam. So he did what anyone in his situation would do and said, well, so much for real life. I'm going to join a commune. Specifically, he became part of the Oneida community in New York. In some aspects, this place was a pretty run-of-the-mill religious fellowship. From each according to their ability, to each according to their need, yada yada. But there are a couple of things that made it special. First off, they followed a doctrine known as Christian perfectionism, whereby everyone would strive to live their lives completely free of sin and reach a divine level of perfection while still on earth. Now, this isn't really unique to Oneida, but whereas most people would achieve this through staunch discipline and careful self-reflection, these guys would just get together and take turns roasting the shit out of each and every member really? over any minute flaw they could possibly have. Real great for the psyche. They also practiced what was basically an early form of eugenics, where aspiring parents would have to submit an application and be judged by the committee on their moral and spiritual fortitude. Oh, no. If they were allowed to mate, children would be separated from the mom about a year after birth and raised communally in the children's wing. What? After all, wouldn't want any of those hopelessly flawed toddlers to think they're deserving of any affection whatsoever. Oh. Oneida also believed in what they called free love, which meant that anyone could bang anyone at any time, as long as they kept it hetero, Why and exclusive relationships of any kind were actually frowned upon, which seems like kind of a weird habit for people trying to 100% FC this whole Christianity thing, yeah. but whatever. But wait, you're saying, how can you have selective breeding at the same time as extremely unselective breeding? Aha! See, that's where male continence comes in. Under this rule, a pair could go at it for as long as they wanted, with the caveat that the dude's not allowed to nut, pull out or otherwise. That way, it's not a sin. After all, as the Bible says, if the dick don't spit, you must acquit. Paradoxically, no such rule existed for the women. In fact, not only did the commune believe in female orgasms, they actually prioritized them, which is like unheard of in the 19th century. Right. They'd even have the middle-aged women of the society train the teen boys in the art of holding in the old pelvic sneeze. That way, there wouldn't be any chance of conception in case the guy goofs up his first few tries. So anyway, young Gito joins this whole thing and endured countless blows to his massive yet fragile ego, thinking he's at least going to get a piece of this communal action. Except, the criticism towards him wasn't just a formality like it was for others. Everyone there genuinely fucking hated him <laughs> on account of the fact that he was a raving neurotic narcissist. He never caught a single piece of this allegedly free love. And after a while, they all started calling him Charles get out in the hopes that he'd leave. This is real. And after five long years of this abuse, Guiteau finally got the hint and moved to New Jersey. He tried starting Fucking a newspaper hell. themed around the Oneida religion called the Daily Theocrat, except nobody cared, so that failed. He went back to Oneida and tried to sue the place in order to get back pay for all his voluntary unpaid labor while living there. But apparently I'm mad butthurt isn't a valid reason for prosecution, so mm. that went nowhere. Finally he said, well, when your devotion to God has failed you, there's only one path in life left. Time to become a 
a lawyer. He managed to pass an examination to gain admission to the Illinois bar and subsequently joined a law firm in Chicago at the age of 27, where he met his soon-to-be wife, one Annie Bunn. Of course, Guiteau never really got to be a lawyer. He only argued in one actual court case. Most of his time was spent doing bill collection for random clients. This job gave him insight into how debtors think and operate, which allowed him to turn into quite the con man, dodging bills whenever and wherever he saw the opportunity. Even on the job, he'd frequently charge exorbitant contingency fees after the fact, upwards of 75%, and sometimes he'd just wow. keep it all and completely ghost his clients. After all, what are they gonna do? Send another bill collector? Well, it turns out they did, so Guiteau and his wife fled to New York. Here he ditched law and started getting into politics. Specifically, he wrote and delivered a speech in favor of Horace Greeley, the 1872 Democratic presidential candidate, and he somehow got it in his head that if Greeley won, his campaign would be so greatly indebted to him that they'd fulfill his desires to be the Minister of Chile, as though a total rando like him could just, you know, what? name a job what and it would fuck? be his. In reality, the speech was an incoherent mess heard by next to no one, and Greeley lost by a landslide. As the years passed, Annie got real sick of living life on the run with a broke ass bitch, and Charles was not too keen on her <laughs> weighing him down either. But back in the day, you couldn't just divorce someone willy nilly, you needed a valid reason for it. So Charles concocted the brilliant scheme of banging a prostitute and then having her testify in court. The plan worked, with the pair successfully divorcing in 1874, I mean... and the only downside was syphilis. Whoops. Guiteau oh, started cool. dabbling in theology again around this time. He published a book called The Truth, which was almost entirely plagiarized directly from John Noyes, the founder of the Oneida community. But despite being a man of God, Guiteau was still very much a two-time environment, and moved frequently in the dead of night to keep collectors off his tail. His brother caught wind of this and wrote him a letter basically saying, Hey, uh, maybe you should pay your bills now and then so you can be, you know, a functioning member of society. Yeah. To which Charles replied, and I quote, Find seven dollars in clothes. Stick it up your bunghole and wipe your nose on it, and that will remind you of the estimation in which you are held by Charles J. Guiteau. God damn. damn. And to his own brother, the madman. Fuck. Soon after, he got arrested, bailed out by his sister, lived with her for a few months, attacked her with an axe, yeah, went to D.C., rambled about religion to anyone who would listen, moved to Boston, got in a boat accident where everyone in his boat was fine, but everyone in the other one fucking died, Holy took this as a shit. sign from God, That's moved insane. back to New York and got back into politics in 1880, this time as a Republican. During this campaign, there were two main factions of Republicans, known as the Stalwarts and the Halfbreeds, which sounds like some Tolkien shit, which we had names <laughs> like that today. Now, Guiteau considered himself a stalwart, and in a similar vein to his 1872 venture, he wrote a wow. speech to promote stalwart candidate Ulysses S. Grant, who was shooting for his third term. But before he got a chance to deliver the speech, one James A. Garfield took the candidacy completely out of nowhere, beating out both factions single-handedly. He was like, rats, how am I going to get power handed to me now? So he literally just scribbled out all the references to Grant and replaced them with Garfield and was like, yep, that'll do it. He read this speech all of twice along with handing out copies to the Republican National Committee. In reality, this really didn't accomplish much, but when Garfield managed to win the election, Guiteau was like, yes, that was entirely me. Oh Garfield is in my supreme debt. As God is my witness, he shall make me a consulate in Vienna or Paris or someplace cool like that. He went to DC to await his inevitable appointment, but obviously nothing happened. What so he started writing letters. A lot of letters. When that didn't work, he started actually stalking both Garfield and the Secretary of State, James Blaine, intercepting them in hotel lobbies, just being like, oh, hey, yeah, it's me, the sole person responsible for your success. Say, how about a consulship? <laughs> All right, you'll get back to me. I get it. Whoa, what, <laughs> what a coincidence. Bastard. Me again. How's that consulship coming? At first, they simply ignored him, but eventually Blaine's snapped, screaming, Never speak to me again on the Paris consulship as long as you live. Oh, dare you. <laughs> Damn you, Garfield! Oh. <laughs> Thanks for disturbance in the force. Maybe daylight savings just made Monday an hour longer. Wow, Garfield, that was quite the we wisecrack. It's amazing how, how you Garfield managed to does. keep things fresh year after year. Burn in hell, beige dog. <laughs> At this point, Guiteau completely renounced any faith in the current administration, and after a lifetime of clout chasing met only with disappointment, he decided his only option was yep. straight up going postal. He convinced himself that it was now God's will to remove Garfield from this mortal plane in order to put his stalwart vice president, Chester Allen Arthur, into power. When he went to buy a revolver, he was given the choice between a wood grip and an ivory grip. He went with the ivory one for no other reason than he thought it would look cooler in a museum, and on July, 
July 2, 1881, he ambushed Garfield at the Baltimore and Potomac Railroad Station, shooting him twice in the back and mortally wounding him, all because he wouldn't give him a job. Garfield managed to hang on for 11 weeks before finally dying, which sounds like hell. Today's yeah. modern yeah. physicians actually believe that Garfield could have easily survived the incident if it weren't for doctors digging through him with unsanitized tools. Hey, modern medicine, thanks for oh. not being worse than literally no medicine. It means a lot. But that didn't stop Guiteau from being formally charged with murder. And that's exactly what he wanted. Matter of fact, Guiteau was over the moon, taking his oh. new nationwide infamy as the fame he always deserved. His trial was just okay. bananas, with Guiteau hurling obscenities at just about everyone there, oh, including his own defense guy. team, <laughs> and formatting his testimony as an epic poem, which he recited in full. He even dictated an autobiography to the New York Herald, which, get this, he ended with a personal ad for a nice Christian lady under 30 years of age. Hey. What a baller. Oh, when the guilty verdict was read, he called everybody there low consummate jackasses, and on June 30th, 1882, Guiteau smiled and waved to his adoring fans as he was walked to the gallows, where he recited a repetitive, deranged poem he wrote that morning, which was performed in a high-pitched falsetto voice, since it was written in the point of view of a child. He asked for a full <laughs> orchestra to play during the reading, what? which I don't have to tell you that went nowhere, and promptly thereafter, he was hung. When the gallows dropped, people were probably like, ugh, Jesus, it's finally <laughs> over. I just came here for a nice little execution, they subject me to all that. I want my money back, frankly. So it just goes to show, you can't always get what you want. Unless that thing is getting everyone to hate you, that's extraordinarily easy. But for everything else, you're gonna need a combination of hard work and know-how. While the former must ultimately come from within, there's plenty of resources Here out there for the that. latter. The best of which is a seldom talked about The link in the description can get two more absolutely free. Till next time, please release that tension and get that comprehension today. Anyway, that's all for today. Till next time, I'm Sam and Ella, and I oop and I oop. What the fuck? <laughs> I want to go back to the uh, the Christian colony where everyone yeah. judges each other and then bones. I'm. I'm Is a this just like confused. like you're not you're not allowed to do this 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 this? They that, have to but... have a kink shaming fetish. Yeah. It's like, what and did then you... also, what? like, you're not allowed to, you know. Yeah. So, I wonder if that's that may have something to do with some other things. Edging in the name of the Lord. Okay, that's I weird. wasn't going to say it, but, like, I mean... Maybe that's where soaking was invented. Because you... But, no, you're not allowed to move. Maybe. Maybe. I don't know. A crazy There's bastard. A, lot of... a real crazy bastard. I love how, like... A large majority of his life was spent judging people, and then he just like ran away from doing bad things a bunch. Oh and yeah, then, and then murdered somebody. Not just somebody, but like literally, you know, the guy in charge. So crazy, crazy. Sam oh yeah, Mandela. find seven dollars in clothes. <laughs> yeah, find seven. What the hell? Uh. Oh, Jake says. Find, yeah, find seven dollars enclosed, stick it up your bunghole, wipe your nose with it, and that will remind you of the estimation in which you are held by Jake. Thanks, Jake. Thank you, Jake. But uh, anyway, ridiculous video, Sam Onella always learning us something. I've never heard all that. All of that, like, I, okay, people are gonna be like, mm, you don't like history. I don't like history. But whenever Sam tells me a story, it sticks, okay? I remember yep. that shit. All those pelvic sneezes just stick. Thank you guys for checking or this out. Vera. We'll see you in the next one. <laughs>